Sometimes you got to give the people what they want. Highlights. And although this video is full of exciting footage and concepts, one of the main criticisms I get on my channel is that sometimes my videos are hard to follow, which leads to people getting lost. And I genuinely appreciate this constructive criticism, but in my opinion, this video is going to be the most guilty of that. But I have a lot on my mind right now, so buckle up because we're going to put it all out on the table. So here we see Joseph Chen, who's one of the lighter athletes coming out of B team, and he's working from mount. And his opponent successfully recovers back into a lockdown. But Joseph stays calm, and with his near side underhook, he starts to work his way back to mount. And as Joseph is threatening to mount once again, he sees an opportunity to punch in a second underhook. And because his opponent is doing such a good job at keeping his knees to his chest, Joseph decides to pummel his foot all the way across and pass to the other side, and this was made possible because he took that second underhook. And now with double underhooks from side control, it's very hard for your opponent to prevent the mount. And if you're subscribed, you know that using half guard as a checkpoint has been a huge part of my study recently. And here we see the top player diving on a guillotine in an attempt to pass. And just then we get interrupted by a Dodge Ram commercial. So we're gonna zoom in and see that this guillotine attempt fails, but the top player ends up in chest to chest half guard. Now, if you've seen my most recent video, you know that if you just have a cross face what I would recommend is getting your weight more out to this side here because that's the direction you're vulnerable to be off balanced and that's exactly what happens and now that the Dodge Ram commercial is done we'll zoom back out and see that the top player again does such a good job at resetting back to half guard this is not the pace I expected from uh, from two blue belts but uh, it's looking very technical so far it's good yeah especially not lightweight blue belts <laughs> You say they're flying around. I think a lot of people still believe that chest to chest half guard is utilized in the heavier weight divisions, but not in the lighter ones. But I really think this is going to change in the near future at the highest level, and we're going to see less people spamming cartwheel passes. This is the pace that I expect from blue belts here, that, those, uh, the, that frantic movement and passing. A lot of times when you're doing this frantic style of passing, you're going to leave openings for your opponent to counter, and the choy bar is a great way for them to do that. And we've seen the choy bar be used to enter into submissions and if the ref wasn't in the way got in front, ass you could see it being used as a way to take the back as well and recently i've been trying to use choy bars to enter into k guard and for some reason the camera goes black during this transition but it's very slick you can see the initial choy bar threat and as jed inverts underneath his right foot goes across to taza's left hip and that's what we're looking for when we're trying to enter into k guard from these inverted positions juni here finds himself in a knee shield type situation and as he goes to invert his half guard leg pops out and goes to his opponent's far hip setting up his k guard entry but instead of entering into backside 50 50 he uses it for a very slick guard pass now the reason i'm very interested in developing my k guard game is because i've recently began studying mateus and his straight ankle lock finishes and in his recent match against taza mateus is able to get his foot to that cross hip position and enter into k guard and ultimately to backside 50 50 and from the top player's perspective a good option option from here is to backstep putting yourself in normal 50-50. And knowing this, Mateus predicted the backstep and uses it to end up in outside Ashi, which is his preferred attacking position for that straight ankle lock. From uh, the people who have experienced it, they just say how shockingly tight it is. Shockingly. And they feel like their ankle's about to explode almost immediately. Wow. Now, so far, the only way I've been able to incorporate it into my game is from a position like this, where if someone is really nice, they're going to thread their free leg through, giving you a very easy inside Senkaku entry. But if they're doing a better job of keeping their knee facing away from you, my strategy up until this point has been to attack an outside heel hook on the entangled leg, which is very effective, but I'm starting to think that a more secure way of going about this is to first try that back step into inside Senkaku. But if that does not work, transition to an Aoki lock on the entangled leg and go butterfly Ashi and start to work to get belly down. 
for a very strong finish. But basically, because Mateus used K-Guard to get to outside Ashi, I've been studying Lachlan's K-Guard course, trying to work to develop that game. And another great option from K-Guard is to use it to set up attacks to the upper body. You can see Kata with the red hair getting her foot to that cross hit position to set up her K-Guard entry. Now, a lot of times what the top person is gonna do is they're gonna thread one arm through to your far hip and the other hand is gonna grab your near knee and as they explosively bring their hips forward, it prevents you from entering into K-Guard. And as they reach for these grips, it can be a great time to transition to the Barato Plata. And I don't know much about this submission other than it was the secret weapon of Brian from Teach Me Grappling nine years ago. But Kata used it very successfully throughout the PGF event. And it looked like to get a strong finish, she would off balance her opponents to the side of the trapped arm. And from there, she would sit up into a Tariko Plata type finish. And check this out, I think this is one of the coolest sequences of this past month, where Kata uses a Choi Bar type entry to initiate her attack on the arm. She then turns belly down, which puts her opponent flat on her back. And you can see with this left hand trapped underneath Kata's right leg, the Tariko Plata is definitely a possibility at this point. And realizing this, Emily does a great job of temporarily separating her hands and reconnecting them so Kata no longer has her hand trapped. So now Kata starts to attack an arm bar, but she has has two torso legs and no leg controlling the face of Emily, making it very easy for Emily to do a hitchhiker escape and get to her knees. Now normally when I have two torso legs, my general strategy is to take out my bottom leg and let them turn right into a triangle. But when Kata follows Emily up, this is where the magic happens. She hops her knee back over that left arm of Emily. So now as they turn back over, she lands in a very strong Tariko Plata finish. I thought that sequence was awesome and I'm excited to start to work it into my Choi Bar game. Another way to use the Choi Bar is to set up the False Reap like you see Jed and Claire doing here. And one of the best resources to learn False Reap details is Kieran Robert Kachuk. You can see Kieran starting in Reverse De La Hiva, but then using that Reverse De La Hiva hook to stretch his opponent out. He then uses a deep De La Hiva hook to keep his opponent extended as he pummels his right leg to the outside. Now as we pause here you can see there's nothing really stopping our opponent from stepping forward and threatening a guard pass. But this part here is why I'm so excited to add this to my game. Because if our opponent decides to step forward, we can use our top foot to extend them further than they wanted to go as we do an inside spin into backside 50-50 with immediate heel exposure. The other option our opponent has is to kind of sit back and play a more defensive game, which will give you the space to either throw in your false reap or enter into 50-50 like you see Kieran doing here. I am sure Kieran's going to have a lot more detail when he comes out with his false reap instructional, but I've been playing with this combo a bit myself, so I wanted to share with you guys a few insights that I've found to hopefully save you some headaches. Just a word to the wise guys. The first being that when you're using this deep De La Hiva hook, you're a bit susceptible to the classic backstep to inside Senkaku. So as Kieran does, be sure to do a good job of keeping them off balanced and their hands busy so they're not using their hands to pull your leg to make the entry more accessible. The second insight, which really made things a lot easier for me, is that initially your hand is grabbing their knee from the outside. But after you release that grip to allow your foot to go to the outside, when your hand re-grips their knee, it now grips on the inside. And this is going to make that inversion to backside 50-50 much easier. And it makes sense because basically we're putting ourselves in this reverse shin on shin position that we saw Lachlan showing Jacob Couch. And Lachlan takes that same grip on the knee when he's inverting to backside 50-50. So those are just a few details to get you going, but Kieran would definitely be a better resource for you to study if you wanted to add this to your game. And if you do find yourself using the false reap to enter into inside Senkaku, but you're not able to expose the heel for the finish, you always have the option to transfer to a straight Ashigarami and start searching for that Z-Lock finish. But we're not going to dive into the Z-Lock because every nerd in school is talking about it. That's me. So we're going to circle back to Kieran and talk about how people are trying to use body lock passing to shut down his leg locks. Which makes sense because Luke Griffith just got the fastest submission in WNO history and beat out Sofia Casella by just a couple seconds, both of which were leg entries off of loose styles of passing. And previously when Kieran would find himself in a body lock, he would pummel his hand through to reestablish an underhook. 
which you have to be careful doing because it can very quickly lead to your opponent establishing a crossface and an underhook. And at this point, you're just praying that they haven't seen our latest video on how to pass from chest to chest half guard. So now instead of pummeling his hand in from the north, Kieran brings his hand all the way around and pummels it in from the south, which disrupts the body lock but also prevents the crossface. And from the closed guard, we've seen Dane Leak use this same hand pummeling strategy, where he'll bridge to make space for his hand to come in from the south as he transitions to a triangle or armbar from the closed guard. And that is just a very old school fundamental approach, but I like the way Kieran used it to prevent the body lock. But you can also use these same pummeling tactics to set up your Barato Plata. So I think just naturally, as people are getting better at using body lock passing, people are gonna get better at defending it. And one of the most common defenses is to not let your opponent flatten you out and then use a sumigashi to take them over. And we've seen Craig Jones use this defense quite a bit in training. Now, I don't even know what this is called, but you can see as Craig is trying to flatten Nick out from the body lock position, Nick puts his foot on the ground to initiate a bridge, but Craig immediately hooks it, which kills the bridge and Craig smashes past the guard. And we see Ethan using a very similar hook from the turtle position to initiate his back take. But if you're using this hook from the turtle position, be sure you know what you're doing. Because if you just lazily put your foot in between your opponents, they can roll into your legs. And if they do as Jordan did and roll into a knee bar, what the attacker wants to do is lift their hip off the ground to prevent your knee from rotating up. So from a defensive perspective, we need to make it difficult for them to rotate their hip up and over our knee. And one way to do that is by pulling their top knee out as we fight their hands. As we work to try and turn our knee up towards the ceiling and end up in 50-50 or outside Ashi. But again, we got a little sidetracked from our discussion on body lock defense. And you can see Reese preventing himself from being flattened out and then using a sumigashi to complete the sweep. And if you go on Donaher's Instagram page, you'll see that Reese is in quite a few of his pictures. So he is definitely very involved in the training at New Wave. And as we study Reese's performance at the PGF event, it was pretty clear that he was actively seeking the crucifix position. And he used it to control and submit people on his way to winning the event and taking home the belt. Now in his first back attack instructional, Donaher referred to the crucifix as a very underutilized position in jiu-jitsu. But lately, after seeing a lot of crazy entrances into the crucifix. I'm starting to think that you need to book a Craig Jones seminar as soon as possible. We're going to be doing crucifix escapes. No, I'm just kidding. But in all seriousness, you need to go to Cave Mike BJJ on Instagram and scroll down to you see his crucifix video. And this will give you a very good understanding of the games being played in the crucifix position. Because I think it's something that we're going to start seeing a lot more of at the highest level. Now, if you made it through that whirlwind of a video, I really appreciate your support. Leave a fist bump in the comment section and we'll see you in the next video.